All right. Um, and thanks everybody for logging in. We're going to do a, a, a tag team presentation this evening. We'll, we'll start out with uh, Bill Ward, UT Extension agent, and he's going to talk to you about uh, pre or post Christmas care of holiday house plants. So, uh, so thank you all for tuning in and, and Bill, take it away. Absolutely. Thank you. So I guess, Phil, you'll be driving the PowerPoint. I can, if that works for you all, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Yeah. So um, that'll, that'll, that'll be great. So, so yeah. So if you don't know me, my name is Bill, uh, UT a &R agent down in Johnson County, Tennessee. Um, so when we were kind of talking about this, uh, I've had a lot of questions over the last year, particularly about holiday house plants. Uh, that were just really for the holidays. So that's why I entitled this Now What? Um, so we're kind of going over some of the three basic holiday plants that you might have laying around. Uh, it's January, so what do you do with them now? So, and we'll start with everybody's favorite, the poinsettia. So Phil, you'll advance one. Okay, a little bit of a delay. I'll, I'll get it here in a second. Okay. Well, it seems a lot of a lot of a delay. Hang on. <laughs> there we go. Awesome. So I would love to know the percentage of poinsettias that are bought in fervor in November and then are tossed away after the first of the year. Um, because we love them. They're beautiful. There are at least a hundred different varieties, and we know there's lots of colors that you can choose from, but they're usually here and gone. But if you want to keep those, there's actually some things you can do. And they actually, they're a really maybe a little bit of a fun project for the upcoming year. So you've got your poinsettia. It was beautiful, but maybe it, the leaves are starting to yellow and wilt and fall off. Well, that's okay. Um, they don't like drafts. They don't like a lot of direct heat. Uh, they don't like it really cold. And we'll talk more about that. But if those leaves have started to fall off, um, that's okay. That's a natural part of their life cycle. And when we talk about the leaves, usually we think of plants, especially flowering plants, the most colorful, what we're attracted to is the flower. Well, in a poinsettia, that's actually the bract. So you can see in this picture here, I thought this was a great description that the flower are those tiny little yellow centers, but those top uppermost leaves, the bracts are modified colored leaves and that's what gives us our color. And that's one reason that it can really remain uh, really attractive and, and uh, for such a long time. It's because it's the leaves that change color uh, and have that color rather than the flowers, which can be a little bit more temporary. So this time of year, if it's looking a little poorly, that's okay. We want to be sure and keep it moist, not wet. They can be a little prone to root rot and some stem diseases that wanna uh, happen from a lot of too much moisture. Uh, but it'll be okay. Just kind of leave it alone. They like cooler better than hotter. So don't place it next to the wood stove or anything like that. Um, so how I did these slides is a bit of a timeline. So if you're taking notes, you can kind of lay it all out through the year what you need to do. So January through March, keep it about 50 or 60 degrees. Uh, I'm going to move this one, kind of see it and water it lightly. In April, you can cut that back four to six inches high. Um, what that's going to do, that's going to encourage some new growth and some sprouting. This is also the time you're going to repot it. You want to go at least maybe two sizes bigger. Uh, if you're in a four, you may want to go to a six, and we'll talk about why that is. And you're going to fertilize it with a common household fertilizer, generally about half strength, uh, usually just about once a month. Sometimes you might see it every other week, but usually they're not super heavy feeders. Mid to late May, after our last frost, Start moving that plant, think about it transitioning outdoors, and it's going to take seven to 10 days. Start it maybe on the back porch, let it get used to that. A little bit of light, maybe some filtered light, uh, and then start easing it out two and three days. Don't get in a hurry, it can kind of shock it. Uh, but in seven to 10, maybe 10 to 14 days, it should be good to live outside, as long as you are free from any type of threatened uh, danger of frost. Anything under 50 degrees is going to damage it, possibly permanently. So after that, and it's acclimated, um, you can actually plant it, pot and all, in a large hole outdoors. Um, so Phil, if you want to advance the next slide. 
So this is kind of interesting. You Oh, that's perfect. So you want to keep it in that pot and you want to put that pot in the ground is the best way to do it because you're going to want to move this plant back in the house uh, in September. So when you think about where to put it, you want to need a space that's going to have six to eight hours of sunlight and it's going to like and appreciate some light shade, uh, especially, you know, four or five, six o'clock when that sun is baking. Uh, it's not going to really like that. It could stun it a little bit, maybe kind of wilt it, uh, could even scorch it some. So you want to try to provide us some light shade through the hottest part of the day uh, in the summer. And also you're going to want to lift it regularly. So this is interesting. People don't think about it. Um, what you want to do and maybe once a month is enough. So maybe uh, June, July, and August would be all you'd need to do. And that's why we actually put that in a bigger pot. So you wanna, your poinsettia is in its pot. It's in this nice hole, which you have filled back probably with some really, uh, some perlite or a really um, well draining medium. So we're not holding water, but you wanna lift that pot just to be sure that the roots are not migrating into the surrounding soil. If they're starting to move into the medium you've added, that's okay for the first month or so. Uh, but if it's really starting to be a problem, you're gonna actually need to repot it again because you're gonna have a transplant shock uh, right when you really wanna move it into the house and have it start its cold period and its dark period. So lift it about three times just to be sure those roots are still contained in the pot. Um, water it regularly, uh, not too much. Um, and just kind of kind of enjoy having a poinsettia in your yard or garden because you may be the only one in town that does. Um, so mid-June and no later than mid-August, you want to pinch some shoot tips. So what that'll do, that again will encourage it to be a little bit more full and it will be a, a really kind of nice full plant. But don't do it after mid-August. Uh, that would be the latest. And if you just do it once, uh, you want to lean towards mid-June to early July would be fine. Mid-September, you can go ahead and bring it indoors. Uh, again, you may want to work to uh, climatize it just a little bit, but it's usually not near the shock is from outside or from inside to outside. Um, and then late September to early October, you need to hide it. So all the plants that we're talking about today, at least the first two, are um, cool weather plants. And they really need, for them to shine, they need a dark period and they need a cool period for them to really um, put on a show. So from late September to early October, um, you're going to want to put that in a closet, maybe in a spare bedroom where it's going to be cool and dark. And you need at least, you know, I've seen several different things. Um, 12 hours is a minimum. Whoop, 12 to 16 hours is going to be kind of your minimum there. Um, kind of with when we talk about Christmas cacti um, to really start bringing that color out. So during the day, you can check it. Uh, maybe, like I said, be sure it's kind of moist, but not overly wet. But it's a, you really do not want to disturb that dark period. Um, it's very sensitive as our Christmas cacti. Uh, if, you know, car lights, street lights. If you flip the light on, looking for a midnight snack, it's going to disrupt that dark cycle and it could uh, negatively affect, right, the development of the color in those bracts. So just kind of keep it in a nice dark spot, like in a closet. Uh, from November onward, you can start moving it out. You're going to start to see some color. Again, it likes 60 to 70 degrees in the day and 50 to 55 at night, which is one reason why I think a lot of poinsettias uh, hit the trash after Christmas. Um, because we usually keep our houses uh, usually not much warmer than 70, um, but they do really like that 50 to 55 degrees at night. So when you start seeing that, you can pull it out, um, just kind of, again, keep it watered, but not overly watered. And then from late November on, uh, you can enjoy it. So they're really also easy to, to root and sprout. So in the spring, when you start doing some pruning uh, with a little rooting hormone, and again, like maybe a half perlite and some compost or actually some half perlite and peat moss would be a really great way to root that and you can give that as a as a gift. Yeah, so there's your poinsettia. So next are Christmas cacti. So this is really interesting. Um, really, we might want to call them holiday cacti. I got in trouble for this once um, because I wasn't saying Christmas cacti. 
But actually, there are three different types of holiday cacti, and most people don't really know what they have. The most common is going to be the what we call the, the Thanksgiving cacti, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, and if you see that on a label, if you're purchasing a new one, um, you'll see S truncate, and I'm not good with my Latin, so that might be a little, a little funky, um, but that's going to be your Christmas cactus, and this is the one that's most desirable uh, for the holiday season. The other one, which is the Easter cactus, right, so it's going to be blooming around our Easter time, so you'll see the S, uh, G there, and then the true Christmas cactus is actually a hybrid, and you'll see that S uh, cross buckley eye. Um, more than likely, if you have a true, and we'll look at the, we'll go on if you want to go to the next slide, Phil. You want to take a look at what you actually have. So, Grandma's Christmas cactus may be a Thanksgiving cactus. And the easiest way to tell is to look um, essentially at the, really, they're not leaves, but to kind of look at what you have in the shape of those uh, there. So the Thanksgiving cactus is going to have a more ragged, jagged margin. Um, the Christmas cactus is a lot smoother, as you can see in the middle. And then the Easter cactus, uh, it's going to be the smoothest of all. And then sometimes it will have little fine like hairs that come out of the ends of that. Um, the Easter cactus is actually pretty difficult to root. It's the most contrary of all of these. Um, but we don't see quite as many of those as we do the Christmas cactus. And the reason we actually refer to Thanksgiving cactus as Christmas cactus, uh, and why your Christmas cactus is actually a Thanksgiving cactus, is the bloom time. True Christmas cactus cacti are a little bit more delicate, but they bloom in late December, where Thanksgiving cacti will start blooming in the November season, and they'll be beautiful through November, probably mid to late November, on up through December. So kind of that prime holiday shopping and decorating season where the actual Christmas cactus is not going to bloom until after that. So a lot of it's marketing. And also, again, they are just a little bit more delicate. The only way, because you can't get these, is my understanding from some specialists, uh, a true kick Christmas cactus, the only way you can get one of these or the most official, you know, uh, secure way is to actually take a cutting from someone that has a true Christmas cactus. So, uh, okay, next slide, Phil. So what do you do with those? Maybe they're blooming, maybe they're finished blooming. In the winter, uh, especially when they have bloom, you can keep the soil moist. So we think of cactus as li living in the desert, uh, but actually these are very different types. So they can handle a little bit, a little bit more moisture, particularly during the bud formation and blooming period. So keep the soil mo moist right now. Winter through summer, not as specific uh, as the um, poinsettia, what you need to do through the seasons, but they can actually would prefer a little fertilizer. Again, about a half strength of a common household fertilizer uh, once a month, and then one teaspoon of Epsom salts per gallon, but not at the same time as you do the fertilizer. A lot of people don't do this, uh, and they have good results. Some people do, and they swear by it. So you can experiment just a little bit. Uh, spring and summer, put them outside. They prefer a little light shade. Uh, 70 to 80 degrees is really about all they like. Again, too much direct sun can scorch them a little bit, set them back, um, put them under a tree. In their native environment, they actually live in trees, in crooks of trees, you might say, on rock cliffs. So um, they don't have a tremendous amount of, um, of, of needs, but they don't like to be out in the sun like you might think a regular cactus does because um, they're actually from a rainforest tropical environment. In mid-June, you can kind of start pinching some stems, maybe some small, some that might be a little deformed. Again, maybe just to even it up a little bit, but don't do it any later than that. And then mid-September, again, it's time to bring those indoors um, and place in a closet. Again, we have to have 12 to 16 hours of uninterrupted darkness um, and 60 to 68 degrees. If you go a little bit cooler, they're going to probably start to set buds a little sooner than what you want, and you may not be able to control it as well. Above 68, they're not going to have as many buds. Um, 68 is the sweet spot, but you do have about eight degrees that you can play with. Now, once you start to see buds set, it is very important that you do not move them. 
So as you see that last point, early to mid-November, you can move them after bud set. Um, you know, so when bud formation is going on, they need to really be um, left alone because they're going to be very delicate even after buds set. So that six to eight weeks, you're going to bring it out of the closet. I know several people that will put them in their basement and they do great in the basement. But again, if you take it from a 65 degree basement and you put it in an 80 degree kitchen, um, it's going to probably experience a lot of bud uh, drop. Um, so you're probably not going to have the show that you need. So again, you can put it in places where you're going to be, but again, you want to try to climatize it a little bit and try not to shock it with, with temperature because again, they can be pretty temperamental when it comes to temperature extremes. So uh, again, late November through December, you can enjoy it. Uh, and then when January rolls around next year, you need to make an inheritance plan for this because we know they can live for decades. It's very common to see some that are 100 years old and older. So there's a good chance if you take care of it, it might outlive you a little bit. Um, so you might want to think about that. You might want to think about that. Um, and then the final that we have is the Norfolk pine. So these were brought to my attention a few, uh, just actually a couple of years ago as an alternative to one, it's a great house plant and it makes a nice little living Christmas tree. Uh, they're really fun. You see them a lot in most grocery stores and they're anywhere from two to maybe three feet. I've seen some about a foot tall and they're really full and bushy. Um, and they make a great little house plant. Curiously, they're not a true fern or a pine or a fir tree. They're from a completely different plant family. That was around during the Jurassic and Crustaceous period. Um, they survived a bunch of extinction events and they really just exist in the uh, Southern hemisphere, uh, not too far from New Zealand. So they again can be a little bit picky. Um, they really need a microclimate. They really need a, uh, a lot, of, lot of humidity, a rock-filled saucer. So you can kind of see that pot there in that picture. If you had a larger, kind of one of those drain um, saucers, you put some rocks in that, even some gravel, and you keep that with water, filled with water, and that constant evaporation will keep that plant humid. Um, because otherwise, um, they're gonna to start to wilt those, the, uh, the leaves there. They're actually pretty soft, but once they begin to get too hot, um, placed in drafts, they get too dry, if, or if they get cold. Again, they really don't like temperatures under 50 degrees. Uh, they'll start to get very prickly and very brittle and they'll start to fall off. So um, a very humid microclimate, medium light. Again, these don't like direct hot sun. They will, you'll fry them. So they're a nice plant to have on the back porch or the front porch if you have some shade. Uh, you can fertilize monthly if you need to and repot as necessary. Something to really consider if you're going to try to keep some held over is, as you can see, if you look at this one, it looks like a really nice full plant. There's at least three primary stems there, and there can be five to seven. So when you go and you purchase one, it may look beautiful, but you might have five to seven little Norfolk pines, and that's okay for a year or two, but if you wanna keep it, you will eventually have to thin those down to just a single, really after three, you know, three to five years. If you get a small one and it's got five, uh, you wanna keep it the next year, you'd probably trim a couple of those out. And then two years later, you would either need to trim out, cut out, pull out, or repot some of those others. So you just have a singular plant per pot. So um, if you, next, Phil, which I think I might be done. Awesome. Uh, if anybody has any questions for, for Bill, uh, or we can save those to the end. However you want to do, if you want to ask now, or, or he'll still be around at the end, however you all want to do that. Um, I have a comment, Phil, it's to Guida. Okay. Um, Mr. Ward, one thing I didn't hear you mention that I'm curious about is the amaryllis. Often, a lot of times people use it in the winter as well. Right. I haven't, honestly, that was not one that I looked into. Um, I've had a lot of calls for these three plants. Um, and, and personally, I'm not very familiar with an amaryllis, but that is a great one that I need to look into. 
So uh, I'm sorry I don't have an answer for that one, but I I need to work on that. Oh, not a, not a criticism, just a point that <laughs> that's that's one that I grow a lot in the winter too, and uh, all of those others are um, staples, I guess you could say, of the mm-hmm. winter plants in the home. Right, I, I'll make I, a note of that. That would be good to have in my my stash for information. Thank you. And uh, the thing about the cacti growing at different or blooming at different times of the year, mm-hmm. uh, I've always found that to be so unique. And, and you really, you don't know until it blooms what you have, uh, you unless know. you know those, um, as you pointed out, the design or the shape, unless you know the shape, sometimes until it blooms, you don't really know what you got. You don't. And part of the problem is one, those distinctions, that's the Iowa State publications. That's, that's the one that most of us probably use to identify different types of cacti, but it's a little bit exaggerated sometimes in what you might see on the actual plant. And what I've had encountered is people will purchase a holiday cacti from the grocery store and they don't really know what they've got. You know, just like you said, until it blooms, it's not as very specific uh, as it really needs to be. So it definitely causes some confusion. So thank you, great question. Anybody else have any other questions? All right, Jeremy, I'll let you have it. Really great stuff there. Uh, awesome stuff. You know, that's something that we we don't uh, think about uh, often. Uh, we we buy these uh, these poinsettias. Uh, I'll go back to poinsettia. We bought the poinsettias, and then uh, the end of the season. Uh, they have a, you know, they're, they're a little anemic looking and we tend to toss them out, but it's one of those things that we can hang on to and continue using it uh, year after year. So uh, good stuff. Definitely good yeah, stuff. You, thank you. And they're a great, pretty easy plant to propagate so that you can grow some and you can get, and you can give them away. So yeah. yeah That's even great better. Plant. That's even better. Nice Christmas yeah. presents from year for years to come. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Phil, I'll let you go ahead and change it to the next slide. We're going to shift gears just a little bit here. We're, we're staying with houseplants. You know, uh, I want to cover a little bit about houseplants and lighting, uh, the lighting itself. Uh, you know, winter winter's a difficult season for houseplants. You know, uh, we've got plants that we uh, we, we keep outside uh, throughout the year uh, or actually during the warm months. And uh, I'll cover a few of those, uh, maybe a few stories about some uh, in, in a couple of slides in the future. But uh, it's a difficult season for them. Uh, you've got uh, the low light, uh, the days are shorter, the sun angles lower, uh, and the weather is often, you know, overcast. Uh, now today was a different story. Finally, we've got some sunshine. So uh, if you have a nice bright window or uh, or even a sliding glass door, uh, those things are awesome. Uh, that would be a great place to have a a plant that needs light, and we'll we'll talk about that. Um, but the key to growing healthy house uh, house plants is definitely the light source, uh, and the light needs for for that plant. Uh, Phil, if you'll go ahead and put it on the next slide. So, low lighting, as you know, most homes. Um, office buildings, that sort of thing, uh, just do not have the efficient lighting, you know, that these plants are going to need. Uh, and then some plants, you know, out there, they don't need that to, that much light. So we'll cover that a little bit later on. You know, fluorescent bulbs are going to give you the best light source. Uh, one of the good things is uh, with the new LEDs, and I'm looking up here at my ceiling, uh, the new LEDs that we have, you can get a lot of the brightness settings on them. Uh, and that, that helps, uh, but the fluorescent bulbs are going to give you the best source of light uh, and give off little heat, uh, and, and same true of the new LED bulbs. They, they give a lot of light off and very little heat. Um, also, given the uh, location of the plants, uh, light may only uh, be needed for a few hours a day. Like I mentioned, uh, you may have one of those sliding glass doors or a great kitchen window or, or a bay window uh, in, your ha- in your living room. These are great locations. And so you may only need a, a few extra light hours per day to help these plants along. And so they already may be getting the, enough light. Uh, next, next slide, Phil. So, you know, house plants can be uh, grown successfully without the use of artificial light. Uh, 
And, you know, so we have, we've definitely seen that. Um, and we'll cover that in a minute. Uh, but selecting, you know, if you're looking at buying, if you're looking at buying a house plant or you already have, you know, selecting the right plant for your situation or moving plants may be needed. For instance, uh, if you have a, a, a house that, that's sitting back uh, kind of in a holler, so to speak, and doesn't get a lot of light, you may need a low light plant. Uh, that may be something that you want to look at. Or the plants that you have, if they're starting to look a little, like I said earlier about the poinsettias, starting to look a little bit anemic, you may need to move those plants around. You may need to move it toward a, a higher light source or uh, an area that's getting some, um, some higher amount of light. Also, uh, there's some plants out there, and we'll cover it in a minute, uh, aloes. Uh, aloes need lots of light, and some that don't, which are spider plants. For instance, aloes. Uh, we take, take a, uh, think of aloe as, as a uh, burn plant, uh, quote unquote. Uh, my mom always kept, kept one in the kitchen, and she kept it in the kitchen window, and it faced basically east, southeast. And so it caught a lot of morning sun, and uh, it, it was able to thrive on that morning sun um, decently in the winter. So uh, um, that, that's something that needs a lot of light. Uh, some that don't need light, a lot, a lot of people have spider plants. Uh, they don't need a lot of light. So uh, uh, that's something you need to look at when you're uh, selecting plants. What environment are you taking this into? Are you taking it into a house of low light? Are you taking it into an area that you might have a nice bay window or a sliding glass door or something like that? Um, Bill, if you'll go to the next one. So here's some examples uh, of light or, or of uh, plants that need a thousand or more foot candles or direct uh, sunlight. The aloe, like I mentioned, the burn plants. Um, uh, you know, you see these, a lot of people, like I say, keep them in the kitchen. Uh, you get burned in the kitchen, you go after that aloe plant, uh, and they work great for that. Um, uh, we've already talked about the poinsettias and the cactus, uh, citrus plants. Um, Shad, uh, had a lemon tree and he may want to mention this later, but Shad had a lemon tree at his office and he used to keep it out, um, <clears throat> in, um, outside the office and it actually bared lemons and was very intriguing, uh, but he actually kept this outside and during the uh, colder months, he moved it inside and where he would take it to is that their staff kitchen had a lot of windows in it. And so he kept it in there uh, because it got a lot of sun. Uh, and uh, it was probably one of the most sun sunlit rooms uh, in their whole building. So uh, that's something there. Uh, rubber plant is something that needs a lot of sun and possibly direct sunlight. Uh, succulents, most herbs, we don't think about herbs as being a house plant, but a lot of people uh, raise herbs inside. That way you can have uh, fresh herbs all year long. So those are some of the, uh, high lighting, uh, they, they need the high lighting, that sort of thing. Go ahead, Phil. All right, for some of the medium lighting, which you're, you're looking at 500 to 1,000 foot candles, which is gonna need the partial or indirect, things like African violets uh, and Boston ferns. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people will have ferns. Uh, they'll have them hanging out on their porch all summer uh, and spring, summer, and in the fall, they'll bring them in. So they don't need uh, a lot of lights. Uh, so you can bring those, bring those in. English ivy, chivalera. Uh, my mom, uh, I think she still has a couple of chivaleras, but I can remember growing up, uh, she had some of these. And uh, I don't know what was the worst part of the year, putting them into the basement in front of the sliding glass door to where they could get a little bit of light or dragging them back out every every summer. So uh, um, one of those things, they do need light. Uh, I found that out, uh, a little bit of light, uh, some partial light. I found that out a hard way in trying to protect one uh, in a basement. I felt that it had enough light, but it didn't have enough light. So these actually need their medium lighting. They're gonna need that. Uh, I mentioned the spider plant earlier. It's just needing some partial lighting, doesn't need a lot. Uh, azalea is another one, begonias, and then we talked about the Christmas cactus as well earlier. Go ahead, Phil. All right, some, so some low, low lighting is uh, uh, philodendron and peace of lily really uh, don't need a lot uh, of lighting. They need a little bit of indirect lighting, nothing major. 
And so uh, uh, I just wanted to cover a few of those. So just look at those lighting uh, step stages that these plants need. Uh, go ahead to the next one, Phil. Okay, so plant needs uh, a little bit. You know, they've got to have this light to convert the water, carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide into the sugars they need to survive. Uh, this is going to allow the plant to live. That's where you start to see plants that don't get sufficient lighting starting to get anemic. Uh, they just start to get really, uh, uh, you know, start to have issues. And without that correct lighting, those plants cannot photosynthesize. And therefore, that stored food uh, reserves uh, to remain healthy, uh, they will that will be depleted. In other words, they can't uh, continue to store those foods and what they do have, uh, it will de be depleted and they start to, basically they just start to go downhill from there and, and eventually die. Next, next page, Phil, and I think this is the last one. So uh, some, some plant lighting, uh, how, you know, how to tell if the lighting is not right for your plants. They're gonna have stretched appearance. Uh, they're gonna have dead or dying older foliage. Uh, the leaves are lighter than normal. You know, if you're expecting a dark green leaf when you brought it in uh, from the florist or, uh, or the store or even from outside and they start to get lighter, that's, there needs some lights. Um, the leaves are abnormal looking. You've got some abnormal growth there as well. Those are, that's just some of the ways to tell if the lighting is not right for your plants. Okay, Phil, I think maybe this next one's the last one. All right, so knowing the plant, um, knowing the cultural needs, you know, uh, like I said earlier, you need to know the plant. You need to know your envir the environment you're bringing into. That includes the lighting. Uh, and this is gonna keep that plant healthy because they it needs lighting to survive and each plant needs a certain amount of light. Uh, you need to look at, do you need to move the plant? Is the plant acceptable where it's located at, or is it something that it needs to be moved into a different portion of the house? Is it getting too much light? Is it getting not enough light? Most of the time, it's just not getting enough light. Uh, also, selecting new plants for the situation they'll be placed in. You know, are you bringing a new, are you looking at buying some new plants uh, that you're gonna put in your home or in your office? Uh, definitely uh, select the right situation uh, for those. So, Phil, I think that's it. Um, any questions, any comments? I can't believe you remembered the lemon tree. The lemon tree. I always <laughs> thought that was the coolest thing, Shad. The lemon tree, it was cool. Uh, uh, I was always impressed, especially when there were thumb-sized lemons on it. That was, that's pretty cool. I think uh, one Christmas break is what did that tree in. If I remember right, uh, it was left in the office or maybe it was at our house, but uh, it went a long stretch where it didn't get watered. And I think uh, when I came back from that break, all the leaves were shriveled up and dead, but that's what uh, caused it to meet its demise. Well, it was, it was pretty impressive. I had to add it in there. Uh, it was one of those things that impressed me. So, uh, uh, and then we had a gentleman here in Harlan County that used to raise a banana tree and he would bring it inside every year and actually uh, it would bear bananas. So, uh, but uh, there's some information on lighting and Shad, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, very good. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so <clears throat> if we're going to have this talk about house plants, uh, we have to talk a little bit about uh, the problems that you might encounter. And uh, some of those problems are gonna be insects and diseases. And uh, these are things that people don't tend to think about. Um, if it's summertime, I think folks are used to having a, a few uh, bugs in their house and they don't give it much thought, but uh, come winter, um, they pay a lot more attention to it. And so <clears throat> we're gonna hit on some of those. So, when you are uh, thinking about some problems that you might have with your plants, uh, don't automatically assume that you know what the cause is. Uh, it may be an insect problem it, that's causing the leaves to turn yellow. It could be a disease or it could be something that's uh, abiotic. It could be something that is uh, conditional. Uh, you know, maybe you have uh, let it dry out or maybe it's not humid enough. Maybe it's like what Jeremy said, uh, you're not getting enough sunlight. 
uh, or it could be that you're overwatering. Uh, all those things could be the culprit. <clears throat> so as far as the insects part of it, uh, I'm just going to uh, start right off the bat by saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, if you will inspect those plants before you bring them in, if you have bought uh, a house plant, um, let's say you went to a uh, hardware store or a Walmart or somewhere like that and you picked up a plant, or maybe your uh, Aunt Mildred uh, gave you one or something like that, uh, check it out first. Make sure that there's not an obvious problem with the plant before you bring it into your home. And don't think that because it came from a big store that it can't have a disease or an insect problem uh, already. Uh, but inspect it and it's, you're saving yourself the problem of trying to rehab that plant. But a lot of times we bring problems into our, our other plants uh, that were spread. You know, that this is kind of like, um, uh, COVID or something. You're bringing a problem in that's spreading throughout all your other plants. And so uh, you just want to make sure that you, you prevent those if you can. Uh, washing uh, off uh, a few problems. You know, if you've got an insect here or there, you can usually wash those off and get rid of them. Uh, sometimes you can hand pick uh, an insect or something off and it'll be fine. Uh, sometimes uh, you can use rubbing alcohol and uh, you know maybe a little um, uh, uh, spray bottle uh, to treat some of the problems. And other times we just have to go full on with insecticidal sprays. And, and you do have to accept that sometimes that's a possibility. So I'm gonna go over some of the more common uh, pests that you might see uh, in your home. Uh, that, that will be associated with houseplants. Uh, this is not uh, an exhaustive list, but this is probably uh, 75, 80% plus of the problems that you will see. And, uh, you know, when I say uh, thrips, there are a bunch of different kinds of thrips. When I say scales, there's multiple kinds of scales. So um, th they may have different colors, different shapes, uh, but we're just going to speak about uh, general insect problems. So the first one is fungus gnats, and this is probably one that if you've had houseplants very long, uh, you have almost certainly had this problem. Um, these insects feed on the uh, um, fungi that are uh, growing in the, the growing mix of the plant, and <clears throat> Obviously, if you know anything about uh, fungi, uh, you know that they like moisture. And so the biggest problem that, that uh, is associated with fungus gnats is that they have been overwatered. The plant has been overwatered if you start to see uh, a fungus gnat problem. And so just back off, uh, let it dry up a little bit, and uh, that can go a long way towards uh, helping to prevent this problem. Um, any excess water in the pot is going to provide ideal uh, breeding habitat. And um, again, just uh, back off the water. Thrips will cause kind of a, a bronzing of the plants. And you can kind of see this in the photo. Uh, as the population builds up of the thrips, uh, th these are sap suckers. And so they, uh, they rapidly multiply and they, they feed on that plant. And as they do, uh, it, it strains the plant and you'll see the bronzing first, but then it'll progress into to yellowing and, and you'll start to see, uh, you know, uh, leaves start to wilt and drop. So um, when you bring a plant in, uh, you really ought to, to isolate it first to make sure there's not a problem. But if you see that you've got a plant that does have a problem, uh, immediately isolate that plant. You're going to put it in quarantine so that if it's near all your other plants, and chances are it is, most people tend to keep their house plants clustered together because they, they're all near a window that has the, the best sunlight. Maybe it's that south side of the house in the winter that gets all the sun. Um, but you uh, want to move that plant, get it away from the others. And then if it's thrips, if you see this bronzing or if you can actually uh, spot the thrips, 
Uh, neem oil is a good place to start, uh, but there is a part of the life cycle of the thrips that is actually in the soil. And so uh, spinosad, uh, and I, uh, that's a typo, um, is uh, something that you could use that will help control uh, the, the thrips at, at that stage. Uh, you might also try imidacloprid uh, granules, and uh, these will be systemic in the plant. So if you're missing any of the thrips when they suck on that plant, they're gonna ingest uh, the imidacloprid and it's gonna uh, take care of them that way. Springtails are another one that uh, more than likely you won't see them. Uh, they're very, very small as you can kind of see from the picture. Uh, once you get to be uh, 50 plus, uh, your, your odds of seeing one of these probably goes down. Uh, but this is a, another uh, pest that is associated with overwatering. They like a lot of moisture and backing off on the, the watering will help uh, control those. And then uh, you can use an insecticide that is uh, made for indoor plants. And again, that could be neem oil, that could be um, um, the imidacloprid, it could be insecticidal soaps. Generally, I would suggest that you start with neem or with the insecticidal soaps and see how those do and then work your way up to these others. I kind of feel like if you use imidacloprid, that's uh, pulling out the big guns and it might not be necessary. Uh, spider mites, uh, this is a problem that usually it's associated with the, the plant leaves turning yellow. Uh, you'll see these chlorotic spots, which that's just places where you're starting to see yellowing on the leaf. Again, isolate the plant. Uh, permethrin is a good one for this. Uh, you can also uh, take the plant outside and, and spray it off. Uh, spider mites like warm, dry environments. And so if you blast them uh, with the, 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 the mister or uh, you know, spray them with a the hose, uh, you can flush a lot of the spider mites off of the plant. And so you've got fewer that you have to deal with. So if you, uh, I would probably suggest that you start with that, that washing uh, and then try the insecticidal soap and then move on up to the permethrin if those don't work. Next. Scales, it, this is a, a problem that um, to me, it's a little more difficult. Um, they can be uh, hidden and uh, they can be encased. Um, a scale kind of refers to the little protective uh, covering that they have on them. And they are sap suckers and they, they um, as they feed, they will produce honeydew. If you're familiar with aphids, you know what honeydew is. That's basically as they defecate, they uh, secrete this little uh, sweet uh, top liquid and that can attract ants and other insect pests. But uh, a lot of times you will see uh, a, a black mold or kind of a, 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 a sooty uh, mold that will be on the leaves that's growing on the honeydew uh, that's produced by these scale insects. Uh, you'll also notice yellowing and leaf shed. And again, this is a, a thing that uh, you can start with insecticidal soaps, but uh, this one, it can be a time issue. They are hard to control when they are inside that, that protective case. And so uh, the easiest way to control them is to time any of the, the soaps or the oils or the, you know, that kind of thing to treat them when they are in the crawler stage. So before they get into this protective shell. Um, if, if you see that they're already at that point, <clears throat> uh, then imidacloprid is probably your best uh, guess. Millibugs, this is one, they, they are uh, easily recognizable for uh, this waxy uh, uh, type coating that's on the outside of them. They have that white appearance and uh, that, that uh, wax can actually help uh, protect them. And um, I've, I've actually got this guys on the, the plant that's at the office. Uh, and Phil's going to tell you why I picked that plant when he does his talk, but um, it, it has been hard to, to get rid of. 
Uh, we've sprayed several times and uh, have not had much luck uh, with spraying these. If, if it's a severe infestation, they tell you to discard the plant because it can be more trouble to try to get rid of them than just starting from scratch. And, and sometimes that's the best option. You know, if you've got a, a plant that's less than ideal, if it's unhealthy, and maybe it's already taken on um, uh, it's a kind of a haggard look to it, um, the effort that you would have to uh, uh, take to, to try to control these would be better spent starting with a fresh plant. And so don't be afraid to, to cut bait, so to speak, and let the thing go and, and start over with a new one. Now I understand if this was a mammal's plant and uh, you know it's sentimental to you, then uh, you'll want to do something and, and um, imdocloprid again, this is one that they ingest and uh, we would recommend that one. White flies are one that when I worked in UK's greenhouse, it, it was the bane of our existence. They are not very easy to control. Uh, they can fly around. They're pretty decent uh, flyers. And uh, it seems like they come from nowhere. Uh, we used to get them on the, the tomatoes and other plants in the greenhouse. And they were a booger to, to try to kill. But they were sap feeders. And if you have a lot of uh, white flies, you'll actually see the little cloud. When you move the plant around, they kind of start to fly. And you'll see this little flush of them. And um, if they have a he heavy infestation, again, they can cause yellowing and uh, leaf drop. They also produce the honeydew. Uh, and you'll want to inspect any new plants to make sure that you're not bringing this problem in. Look at the undersides of the leaves to see if you can see the eggs and, and that kind of thing. That's something you should always do. Uh, Missouri Extension has a publication that, that talks about traps for these. And um, I didn't get to add that link to the end, but I would highly recommend that if you uh, just do a, a Google search for Missouri Extension and houseplant uh, insect pests, uh, it should pull this one up and it talks about the, the traps. and. That's one that I would highly recommend for the white flies, but neem oil will work, insecticidal soap will work, permethrin, and then ibuclopred. And you may have to do a shotgun approach. You may uh, try the least invasive and then work your way up, but these can be difficult to control after they're established. Um, the last uh, pseudo insect pest I'm gonna talk about is slugs and snails. Uh, they usually enter through the soil, and it's usually a soil that has not been sterilized. And so, uh, you know, they're already in there, um, and they come out and they begin to, to grow, and they come up and they have a, a raspy uh, tongue, and they kind of abrade the, the leaf as they feed. And uh, you'll start to see feeding damage from, from slugs, and uh, they obviously... Uh, prefer moist locations. And so anything that you can do to, to try to avoid overwatering the plant would be helpful in controlling these. Uh, the other thing you might want to consider, and this assumes that um, um, you don't have pets or something that's going to uh, interfere with it, uh, but beer traps, they work outdoors and they also work indoors. If you will take just a little uh, bowl um, just something small. I know it's in a, a potted plant, so you don't want some big massive uh, cool whip bowl in there. It can be just something small and pour a little beer in it and put the bowl level with the top of the, the potting soil. The um, slugs and snails are alcoholics and um, they will go in there and they will uh, uh, drink the beer and uh, it kills them. And uh, so uh, that is a, uh, um, I guess, a very uh, low impact way to address this problem. And uh, uh, that's the one I would recommend. So these others, I, I'm not going to have, uh, I'm running out of time to talk about these. So I'm, I'm wanting to hand it over to Phil. But just real quickly, I'm going to uh, pop through some of the disease problems that you might see. And uh, we won't go into the controls just yet, but uh, maybe next time. But I just want you to get familiar with what you're looking at. This is a picture of 
uh, bacterial spot. I think that's on a spider plant, but uh, that's what it would look like. That's not just damage to the leaves, that is a, a disease. This next one is a fungal leaf spot, and you can kind of identify this one because it's got those circles that are starting to come out. And you can see along the margin uh, that it's lighter. And so that, that uh, spot is going to grow as the, the fungal problem spreads. And a lot of times uh, you can sterilize a pair of scissors and you can uh, trim these diseased leaves off so that they're not serving as a source of inoculum for the rest of the plant. Um, but uh, that's not true for every disease, but it's true for some of them. And that would be the case for the fungal leaf spot. But just trim those leaves out and you'll save yourself some headache. Uh, this is a root rot, and you can kind of tell it uh, that the, the plant is just uh, from the base up. It's starting to be uh, very, very sickly. And after you've got a root rot, there's really not a lot that you can do. Um, you know, sometimes this is caused by overwatering, uh, but um, this is a plant that you need to, to start over with. Viruses, uh, I want you to look at the, the leaf on this and you'll see that it's kind of got that mosaic pattern. Uh, it's kind of uh, maybe checkered a little bit, um, but you can see that there's a really light uh, area right next to a really dark area. And, uh, you know, viruses attack plants uh, very similar to the way they attack uh, us. Um, you see that the plant, it's still green, it still looks uh, you know, it's not brown, uh, but there's clearly something wrong with this plant. And uh, it will end up spreading uh, through the plant. Uh, this is one that uh, I would get rid of, uh, but this is a, a viral problem. This is a crown canker, and this is on aloe. And um, if, if I'm remembering correctly, after it has this problem, uh, this is hard to, to do anything with. Uh, it's, uh, it's a canker, so it grows around the, the stem and ends up girdling the, the plant. Um, if you can rescue some of these that haven't been impacted yet, uh, you know, that might be an option, but uh, this is what crown rot looks like. If you uh, are interested in more information, uh, there's Clemson has a lot of good publications. Penn State uh, has some good ones. And again, Missouri, I think I saw some information that was in the slideshow that came from Maryland and New Hampshire. And so uh, if you've not figured this out by now, different states have different extension services that uh, are kind of known for being really good in certain areas. And, um, you know, if you want to, um, um, information on horticultural type things, NC State is always a good one to go to, uh, but uh, uh, Clemson and uh, Penn State are, are really good for this. Uh, that Lancaster one is, uh, I believe that's Lancaster PA, so uh, that's another one you might like. I'm all done, Phil. All right, any questions for Shad on the insects, diseases, abiotic problems? Okay, well, if I can get this to advance, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the benefits of house plants, and this is something that we've covered before. Um, NASA did a study on on the use of house plants to contribute positively to your your indoor air quality, and if you think about it, that, really makes sense that NASA did that because uh, you're you're thinking about people living in a very confined space for a very long period of time, and and so it. They came up with some uh, some specific house plants that you might want to consider, and we'll talk about those really quickly here at the end. But if you think about our modern homes, whether it's a, a mobile home, a modular home, a stick built house, apartment buildings that have been uh, constructed in the last few years, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that these are very efficient, very very tightly put together, more so than in the past. Uh, the negative is, is that they're very tightly put together and, uh, and you're going to have some air quality issues 
in any home, but especially in more, more modern homes, you're going to have some, uh, some poor air quality in a lot of cases. Uh, not only is there not much airflow through those walls, but there's also a lot of different types of materials that are used, different glues and so forth in the construction of the home. So the inside of a modern home may be five to seven times more polluted than the outside. So that's something to think about. And um, uh, the NASA study on house plants, it was a 10 year study looking at, at how house plants impacted the indoor air quality. Uh, they do release oxygen. They absorb carbon dioxide. You learn those two things in, uh, in grade school. They filter dust. They reduce headaches, sore and dry throats, drier, itchy skin and fatigue. So if you're dealing with any of these types of things on a regular basis, you might consider adding some house plants to your home and improve the air quality and therefore uh, thereby reduce some of these um, health issues that you may be experiencing. Reduce stress by absorbing noise. Now, where I live, the noise is not usually a huge problem, but in certain areas it can be. So, uh, so the house plants can can uh, absorb a lot of that uh, a lot of that noise. House plants have been shown to reduce recovery time from surgeries. Um, and want to go through these nine plants recommended by NASA, the specific house plants. And if you want to take it as a 2022 challenge, uh, maybe you can uh, get a pencil and paper ready and, and try to make it a point to have at least one of these plants, uh, each of these plants in your home by the end of 2022. And, and I'm guessing there might be some of you in the group who already have all nine of these. But the nine plants recommended by, by NASA, one was the Areca palm. Uh, this is one that you've probably seen before. You might not have known exactly what it was called but this one releases a lot of moisture. So it, it, it kind of deals with some of those uh, dry nose and throat issues and it removes toxic chemicals from the home environment. The lady palm, the lady palm was ranked as one of the best for improving indoor air quality. Miniature date palms, so a lot of palms in this list, um, very good at removing indoor air pollution. That was one of the, the top contenders that NASA had, uh, had pinned down. The philodendron, which is one Jeremy mentioned, uh, these are good. This is one of those that doesn't need a whole lot of light. So you can put that deeper into your home than, than some of the other plants. Uh, good at removing toxins from the, from the environment. Peace lily is a good one. Uh, another one good at removing toxins. Dracaena, I think is how you pronounce that. Another, another good one for removing those toxins. Boston fern, the good old Boston fern, uh, adds to the humidity of the home. And just like the others, it does remove a lot of toxins. The ficus alii is one that was ranked very highly for air purification. And the rubber plant. Uh, another one that, uh, that a lot of people may have in their home just accidentally, um, may, maybe have inherited that from somebody, but uh, also a very good plant for the benefit of your indoor air quality. Then there are a few others that, that also get an honorable mention. Uh, basically, any, any house plant is going to contribute somewhat to your, your breathing and your, your uh, kind of uh, filter out some of those toxins in the in the carpeting and in the glues and the uh, particle board. Uh, any is going to be, be better than none at all, but, uh, but those nine that I gave you, those are specifically uh, plants that were recommended by, by the NASA study. So ivy is, is a good container. Spider plant is a great one to include. Uh, chrysanthemums are also very good to include in the, uh, the home environment or office environment for that matter. The Gerbera daisies, uh, those are good ones to put on the list. Snake plants, which are, can add a, a lot of interest to a room. Uh, it's really, really odd looking, I think, uh, house plants. Bamboo is, is a good one to include. Dragon tree. And so the recommendation, 
just generally based on the square footage of your home, uh, 10 to 15 house plants for every 1800 square feet. So, uh, so some of you may have that many. Um, I can, I can name a couple of you. I'm, I'm would bet money you have, uh, have a lot more than that, but, uh, but 10 to 15 house plants per 1800 square feet is the bare minimum. If you're interested in improving that indoor air quality. All right. We kind of kind of blew through that, but uh, that's the end. And if you all have any questions for any of us, we'll we'll try to answer those. Bill, was that snake plant the, the plant. tall one that you saw there? That, that snake. I'm sorry. Plant. Was was that the one that you had uh, the photo of? Was the snake? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I think it's also, if I'm not mistaken, it's also the one known as mother-in-law's tongue. Is that? Yeah, the, that's the one that I knew it by. I was going to see yeah. if you were going to refer to it by that or not. But. Yeah. <laughs> that's an old fashioned plant that's been around for a long time. And um, there was a um, another one that I don't know that it made the list, but uh, we used to call them the wandering Jew. But it was a, yeah, a, um, a purple, uh, real pretty um, um, hanging plant. Um, yeah, I'm looking at one right over the top of uh, of the computer right now. Um, and and one thing that's kind of interesting about those plants in the list, as I was going through that, it kind of struck me that at least in my home county in Tennessee, those would qualify as the funeral plants. You know, when you have somebody close to you and uh, and they're distributing plants at the uh, when, when the funeral services are over, those are very often the ones that, that people take home with them. Uh, Melanie got that. a prayer plant that way, and she succeeded in killing the prayer plant. And I, I teased her mercilessly about, uh, of all plants, uh, that she would kill that one. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we get a lot of them that way. All right. Well, if there, there are no questions... Uh, I think what we have coming up Thursday is part two of Appalachian Music. It's by, by Bill Billy Ward. Uh, so that was, uh, I think that's one you all enjoy. So that's Thursday evening at 6 p.m. And uh, anybody else have comments or, or questions? Great job tonight, guys. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, really good. I thought that was great. Thanks to everyone for joining us. You all have a good evening.